Bob was former uh, CEO of uh, Central Bank Trust, uh, earned a law degree from the University of Missouri, and uh, is very interested in politics. And I think you're going to hear some of his musings and thoughts, and uh, considerable musings and thoughts this morning. So if you will, please welcome Bob Roper. Thank you, Joe. It's good to be here, obviously. Appreciate the invite. Uh, about me, yes, I, uh, I don't normally get introduced that way, but I'm what's called a recovering attorney. I got out of that business quite a while ago, but I'm still a member of the bar. As always, what I'm going to do is, uh, well, I'll tell you in a minute exactly what I'm going to say, but uh, uh, I always give my background. Used to be a Republican have kind of evolved to a conservative slash libertarian uh, and I'll intersperse my own opinions throughout my discussion and hopefully end up with, uh, with uh, something worthwhile being said. I'm going to talk about obviously the upcoming session but I'm going to kind of divide it in three parts. First of all, what sort of bills or initiative petitions or other items on the ballot have some legs and a real chance to uh, be passed Secondly, and also, of course, appropriations bills. Secondly, some general observations about where I think Missouri has gone with respect to uh, how you get things done anymore, or really what's, what's, uh, what's happening with uh, that whole process. And then finally, a little bit of license I was given uh, by the show me people when they asked me to do this. Uh, the, uh, I'll end up with my take on about five things this state, our great state, should do, but isn't doing uh, as far as moving us forward to, to be a, a great competitive state uh, as others are doing better and better. Cautionary thought, remember, on this, uh, I talked to a lot of people that really know about state government uh, in preparation. I read a lot, both newspapers and the public prints, but also blogs or uh, newsletters, etc. The cautionary thought is, uh, Everything I say is sort of an estimate that comes from those people. It's not guesswork, but it's the best opinion of what I've heard. But it's early, and we all know that the legislative process uh, is very fluid. Things can change. So I'll tell you what I think is going to happen, but uh, don't take that down as absolutely certain. Let's start off with bills. Around here, one that, something that's very important, obviously, is uh, Mizzou uh, and its budget. Everybody knows that we've gone through some lean years, tough years, where if you can stay even, you're doing pretty well. Uh, truth is, we have more money now. The re economy in this state's recovering, and uh, there may be five or six hundred million more for 2015. So that seems pretty good. Uh, is it really going to be that good for Mizzou? I was surprised when I made my uh, calls and checked it out. I'm not sure it's going to be as good as people think, and here are the reasons why. First of all, K-12 funding is very low. It, uh, the foundation uh, formula is underfunded by about $640 million. And if you don't think they have a higher priority throughout the state than good old Mizzou, uh, I've got news for you. They do. So that's going to be a priority. That'll take a lot of that money right there. Secondly, <coughs> uh, the foundation, there's a bill that's been presented the second time at least. Uh, it's the foundation formula for higher education. And uh, it sounds like a great idea. And it, actually, there's a due date of 2015. The problem is the bills that have been put forward so far are not very healthy for Mizzou. Uh, the, the community colleges come out great, but Mizzou's portion of the total pie allocated to uh, to our uh, higher education function actually has cut three or four percent. So if that bill goes anywhere, uh, and who knows, there's a lot of other people out there that don't feel like we do, then Mizzou will be playing defense and uh, may get higher education, be part of the, the drainage of higher education. Uh, and it is sponsored by a very powerful senator, uh, Pierce of Warrensburg. I don't remember who the the individual uh, is carrying the ball, who's carrying the ball in the house, but that's another threat to Mizzou, and they've got to do something because the law says they have to put this into place. Third, another problem for Mizzou, and it's, 
it's something nobody ever talks about, but as I check this out, it's real and it's big. And that is, remember last September, that was the time we had the veto override on House Bill, I think it's 553, the tax reform bill. Veto override failed. Well, as part of that process, Governor Nixon came up to Mizzou and Centralia, maybe other places, and he was joined on the stump with uh, President Tim Wolf, who went out of his way to uh, badmouth that bill, uh, condemn it, and ask for its override. Now, that didn't go over very well with the Republican majority, to put it mildly. In their minds, correctly, I think, they were saying, now wait a minute, for four or five years, the governor has tried to cut Mizzou every year in his budget. We're the guys that put it all back and saved Mizzou literally millions of dollars. Uh, we saved his bacon at his institution for years, and we're being talked about like that. Uh, so uh, maybe it's not the most professional attitude, and it certainly isn't the attitude of our locals. But from what I can tell, <clears throat> the Republicans out in the rural areas particularly, but a lot of other areas, they just have a less helpful attitude about Mizzou now. That they, they were sort of seared by that experience, and they just uh, don't feel like they owe Mizzou uh, thanks to that, uh, the way that came down as much as they otherwise would. And another thing is it's sort of the rumors circulating that the, the, because of that, the legislature, legislature's going to take a more authoritarian attitude on a lot of the appropriations, particularly about the hospital or other things, because they're just going to take the attitude, well, we're just going to do it our way. Uh, you can make your request, but we'll, we'll give you what we feel like you need based on our view of you currently. Maybe not the highest level of human emotion, but that's, that's out there, and it's out there more than I thought it was. I thought it might go away, but it hasn't gone away. So anyway, and, I, and a couple of the people I talked to indicated that just in general, it's, it's going to get harder for higher ed education money to find its way uh, not only to Mizzou, but other colleges. Medicaid, I think, has grown by a billion dollars in four or five years. Uh, remember now, the operating budget is about eight billion to 8.5. That's what we're really talking about. Medicaid consumes about three billion of it, and it's gone up dramatically in the last few years. I also think, and then there's prisons is another big part. You're not gonna cut prisons very much. We all know that, and, and also, K-12 is part of the education uh, big budget that's part of that eight, eight, eight and a half trillion, or, uh, billion dollars. Well, as I said, K-12, uh, they're underfunded. They're going to come ahead of higher education. So what I'm getting is that uh, it sounds kind of rosy with all that extra money, but for all these reasons and some long term, uh, universities uh, and four-year universities and colleges are going to have a tougher go at it. Uh, they're kind of last in line in a, in a tougher operating environment than I first thought. Don't get me wrong, uh, Mizzou's going to get more money, maybe 5% more, something like that. But as far as uh, breaking the bank and, and fixing things the way they'd like, I don't think so. Second item, what about Chris Kelly's building bonds? He's tried to do it for years so we can fix buildings, not only in higher education, but others like Fulton State Hospital, which is so bad that it, it ought to be condemned in certain areas and probably is not operating in certain buildings. Uh, <clears throat> the, in, the, it will probably pass the House through cap our own Caleb Jones's capable leadership. The Senate will be a lot tougher. It may not make it. Uh, once again, the Nixon-Wolf uh, issue is lurking in the background. The best chance is probably uh, to align that with the transportation tax bill so we can fix I-70 and a lot of other uh, things that are that really needed. And the best chance may end up on the ballot. I, I'm just not sure it's going to make it other than the ballot. And then only if they combine it. But if the transportation uh, tax idea uh, polls terribly, I'm not sure that one's going anywhere. The, nobody wants to put a lot of money into something that's uh, surely going to fail. Tax reform. It will be a redo, largely, of last year's bill, uh, clean up some of the language that bedeviled uh, supporters a little bit. Uh, there's even a hint that uh, Governor Nixon may work with uh, the Republicans on this. You know, I'll have to see that one to believe it, but we'll see. There's a hint that he might, might be there to help out a little bit. Maybe he wants to have on his resume for his next, uh, next office he seeks to, uh, that, he, that he's a tax cutter. I don't know. 
it, if it fails, it will probably go to the ballot. It's more, it's, so I don't know if it gets passed and signed uh, in the legislative process or goes on our, on our ballot. But the sense is, is, sense is that it's, it's going to make it one way or the other. Tax credit reform, 223 million redeemed last year, about 522 on the books. Maybe. There's certain areas that might actually get reformed. Uh, uh, that would be the historic uh, preservation credits. Everybody knows they're too high. Economic development, I'll be back to that one in a little later with some scathing comments. Uh, and finally, low income seniors and the disabled. That last one sounds terrible. It's, no, they don't hate these people. It's just way, way too generous and needs to be cut back. So those might make it. Uh, if, if there's a log jam, that one could be on the ballot too. Medicaid, I'll leave to Patrick. K-12 reform, uh, Senator Ed Emery from my old stomping grounds of Lamar, he, he has a big bill out. Ten-year reform, last in, first out, choice, et cetera. But he'll never get past the education establishment and the governor on that one, the unions, et cetera. So that one will probably go to the ballot. We may actually have, uh, have a chance to vote for a fairly sweeping uh, education reform package. <coughs> Tort reform. A couple of years ago, we had a Supreme Court decision that said that uh, lurking behind the Constitution uh, that had been there since 1819, but nobody noticed, was a provision that you couldn't put a, a limit on malpractice cases with respect to pain and suffering damages. It turns out that wasn't, in the view of the 4-3 majority, a legislative function after all. Anyway, uh, we have a now, we have, have a building crisis of doctors wanting to leave the state because of that. And so there's a good chance for success that that will be taken care of and we'll have uh, some, uh, a little more sanity in that. Right to work. Uh, well, it's a priority of Speaker Jones. Uh, won't make it past the uh, trial lawyers and uh, Governor uh, Nixon, though. But uh, it could be on the ballot. Uh, if it is, the plan would be to put it on the August ballot because if you put it on the November ballot, that will bring out a huge number of voters who wouldn't normally vote, to vote against it, of course, and a lot of our Republican legislators will lose because of that extra turnout. Initiative petitions, uh, there's about four that I think uh, have a good chance. Uh, early voting, that's I think a Democratic bill. K-12 reform, like I talked about. Tax reform, if it goes there, and tax credit reform. Uh, Maybe transportation sales tax, uh, a bill to stop uh, Governor Nixon from abusing his withholding privileges, which is an issue, campaign finance, minimum wage, payday loans, and right to work, as I talked about, if it went in August. So that's, uh, that's what I see at this time. Uh, I told you the second part would be general observations, and here are, here's a few. And this is called from talking with legislators, senators, uh, lobbyists, people that are in the system. Uh, just general observations about how the whole system is performing and operating lately. I'm not sure that there really is such a thing as a veto-proof uh, majority on the big issues. We saw it over and over again uh, last year. So that's despite the numbers. Oh, I guess you could have a super majority, uh, <laughs> or maybe you could get it done, but it's People always assume if you got the numbers, it'll happen. Not so. Uh, more and more people, I think, in the legislature and the Senate uh, are just kind of giving up, the Republicans, that is, of giving up on getting their stuff through uh, the way things are written now. So it's no accident that you're going to see more and more stuff coming to us, the voters, directly. They just don't see it any other way. Election year, number three. It's always harder to pass something in an election year, and the, the reasons are obvious. The veto override idea is even tougher this year. First, the numbers are down a little bit. Uh, secondly, more people are sort of doing their own thing. They're about to be term limited out, or they have a race coming up or something like that, and they're just, they're just not going to do what Tim Jones or Tom Dempsey say for them to do 100%. And finally, there's more partisanship in an election year. It's really that simple. Another observation, and I hear it consistently, and this is something we should be proud of, we have the best delegation ever that we've sent down to uh, Jefferson City. We have a high quality uh, and generally collegial uh, 
field of office holders, both our senator and all of our uh, uh, all of our uh, reps. I hear that consistently that we are the cream of the crop, easily the best we've ever sent down there uh, in total. So something to be proud of. They don't get along on everything, but they sure get along on, on helping the university in this, this region. Uh, another thing, it really looks like it's very difficult to get major reforms, which I'll be talking about in a few minutes, without collaboration of both the legislature and the governor. Ergo, final point in this section, uh, you have to go around the governor to do the stuff I'd like to do, in my opinion, uh, or get a different different governor uh, who has an R by his name because the big stuff, it's very almost impossible to get that sort of stuff done otherwise. Now, I said that I'd close by talking about what uh, I see as some big things, uh, my, my thoughts on what needs to be done. Somebody once wrote, and I love the phrase, that our system uh, regarding the states is, is, he wrote, entrepreneurial federalism, and that is so true. Uh, it is gratifying to see all the wonderful things a lot of states are doing. So the states compete with each other to uh, have the best policies, enact the best laws, uh, so uh, to get people to be interested in locating in their state, living in their state, working in their state, realizing their dreams in their state. So we have an ongoing laboratory of this entrepreneurial federalism. Well, I regret, regret to tell you that Missouri, in that race, in that competition, is literally terrible. Uh, per uh, research done by Joe Hasleg and Mike Podgersky, for about 15 years leading up to, to, I think through 2011, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but it wouldn't have changed since then. Uh, our GDP rate, which is a good proxy for health of a state, I think, was 48 out of 50. Uh, you know, it's kind of hard to be that bad, but we achieved it. Another thing is, a lot of job losses in 2008, 2009, as we got into this terrible economic trench. Uh, Missouri's near the bottom on regaining jobs since then. So that tells me uh, we have some fundamental things we ought to do differently. Fairly simple. What are they? Well, this is me. We need to be a right-to-work state and get rid of the prevailing wage. Simple as that. Uh, as I say, the laboratories at work, uh, and you're seeing it all the time. That's where, that's where companies want to locate, and therefore that's where the jobs are going. Get rid, secondly, get rid of the income tax and especially the corporate uh, tax. All I read on corporate taxes are they're the best job killers you can devise. Uh, get rid of corporate taxes so that people, uh, don't, so that companies don't have yet one more cost to deal with as they try to be profitable. And by the way, it was a few years ago I read a U.S. Chamber of Commerce study that had looked at states and what was made them successful versus just sort of. Uh, and the sloughs of despond uh, it was, and you know what it is? It's a combination of right to work and secondly, no income taxes. You do those two things, you have achieved dramatic, uh, dramatically your chances of long-term success. Thirdly, great re greatly reduce or get rid of uh, tax credit programs, uh, especially historic preservation and economic development. Uh, it's a uh, Oh, the great economist Friedrich uh, Hayek would call it the fatal conceit that somehow we think we can pick winners or losers. Not only is that wrong, that, that we can do that, as we've proven over and over again, but in addition, uh, it, 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 it seems to uh, create crony capitalism and rent seekers uh, all over the place. A well-respected uh, legislator is a guy named uh, Jay Barnes. I think he's out of Jeff City. I love this. I love what he wrote in a, in a I don't know if it was an email or blog or official statement. It was after the uh, Boeing uh, vote. I suspect he voted against it. Instead of picking in winners and losers, I believe the best way to grow our economy is to cut taxes for everyone. It's time for Missouri government to change its economic development model. Rather than a top-down focus aimed at companies like Boeing, we should aim to grow our economy from the ground up with lower taxes for everyone. Oh, man, I could have said it better. Uh, in fact, I wish I could say it as well. Anyway, fourth, uh, it doesn't get a lot of uh, uh, ink or anything, but we have in this state something called the Missouri Nonpartisan Court Plan. It's, uh, 
if you see it in the civics books, it looks fantastic because it takes politics out of picking our appellate judges. I can assure you politics are very much involved, and you will not get on the appellate courts of the state of Missouri, either the appellate courts or the Missouri Supreme Court, without the backing of the trial lawyers. In other words, uh, they have a uh, very, uh, very dominant uh, influence on that. I'm not going to go through how it works. To the point that not long ago, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce rated Missouri 34th out of 50 as a fair place for a business to operate with respect to the legal system in the state. And I assure you, a good reason for that is because of the people that are appointed uh, who definitely want to uh, remember their trial lawyer friends, period. Uh, finally, on the reforms that I think need to be done is K-12 reform. Uh, let's face it, our children are basically the human capital that we're pre preparing for the next generation. And I already talked about Ed Emery's bill and what he would have in it, but uh, we have government schools, we have unions. Now, we all know what the outputs have been compared to other nations around the world. We run 15th to 30th in outputs uh, based on uh, test taking. We've got to do better. And uh, I don't see that anything's going to change uh, unless we uh, do some serious work on reforming uh, K-12. We're not, Missouri is also not lucky. We're not a big energy state. We can't bail ourselves out by finding uh, that there's another Bakken formation underneath <laughs> our, our ground. It ain't there. Surely we'd know by now. Uh, so anyway, my thought, closing thoughts are kind of compare these suggestions that I'm making with what's happening today. Uh, we have that laboratory going on and the flow of people and business to low or no tax uh, business friendly red states is occurring. It's impossible to deny it no matter what our friends on the other side often say. So we're in the funny position of being kind of voting as a red state, but we have a lot of blue state policies that retired our uh, growth and opportunity for the future. I'm going to close with an old quote that I've always found useful. If you always do what you always did, you always get what you always got. And that's, the, that's where we are right now. I hope we have some long-term reforms. Uh, I think a few things are going to have to change, though. Thank you very much. So we, I'm sure there's going to be lots of Q&A, but let's have Patrick give us kind of an overview of, uh, of uh, medical issues that are going on at the federal level. I'll throw it wide open. And then we'll take Q&A after that, OK? So. If you, if you want to take a seat or if you want to sit down. Well, I am older than you. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks again, Bob, for sure. being here today and talking about all the issues that are going for the legislature. Uh, I'll keep my remarks pretty brief. Uh, again, my name is Patrick Ishmael. I am an analyst for the Show Me Institute, and I work in tax issues, tax credit issues, health care issues, some labor issues, and some constitutional issues. Uh, today I'm just going to talk about health care, but I want to give a quick overview of of what the Show Me Institute is really all about. We, we talk about being a free market think tank, and I think, you know, as folks who are in this industry, we oftentimes lose sight of, of what that really means. You know, when we talk about aggregations of knowledge and we talk about pricing and supply and demand, that, that all means something, that's all important. But, but it doesn't necessarily tell the full story. Uh, when you say you believe in free market solutions, what you're really saying is that you believe in people. That you believe in people making their own lives better, their families' lives better, their communities, their cities, their state, this country, and this world a better place to live. And I think that's a very empowering uh, philosophy. Uh, and, and I think we oftentimes kind of go, go way past that in terms of uh, where our focus is. You know, we, we go straight to the acad academic explanation for it, and it's all true. Uh, but it, it's that human component that's very important to, to convey that that's why these solutions are important, and that's why they're powerful, and that's why they work. Uh, the human component is, is especially important when you talk about healthcare, uh, because uh, you know if if things go poorly in healthcare, you know, there are obvious consequences for it. The consequences for bad healthcare policy are bad health outcomes, shorter lifespans. Uh, and, and that's why healthcare is, is a very important issue, and that's why it's an issue that Show Me Institute deals with. Um, so real briefly, uh, last year there was uh, 
there were two positive things that happened on, on the health care front uh, in the Missouri legislature. Uh, one, because there was action taken, one, and the other one, because there was not action taken. Uh, where action was taken was on a bill called the Volunteer Health Services Act. And the Volunteer Health Services Act allows doctors from other states to come to the state of Missouri and provide free health care for people in need. And it's kind of strange that we had to pass legislation to make that possible. The licensing laws uh, in the state actually prevented groups from coming here and, and helping uh, poor or otherwise needy Missourians. And, and that came to a head back in 2011. Uh, everyone here is familiar with the Joplin tornado. Well, after the tornado came through, and, and I was down there just a few months ago, and there is still uh, a scar, uh, probably about a half mile wide and, and a couple miles long, that you can still see the destruction there. Um, a group called Remote Area Medical went to Joplin to provide free eyeglasses. They had a mobile eyeglass van. And uh, they bring in, you know, they're trained and licensed optometrists from other states. Uh, and they came to, to, to distribute these glasses and make these glasses. But they were turned away because there wasn't a local optometrist willing to reside over the event. So you have qualified professionals, healthcare professionals, willing to, to take their time and, and give these, uh, you know, the gift of sight, essentially, uh, to folks who needed it in, a, in a, an area that was just devastated by natural disaster, but they were turned away. And uh, I heard about this in 2012, and there was already legislation that was, you know, it, it had been talked about for a few years, but nothing had really happened. Uh, and uh, finally, in 2013, uh, the Voluntary Health Services Act passed. Um, this is uh, a great thing for the state of Missouri. It's certainly not a, an all-encompassing health care solution, and it's not intended to be. Um, but it, it is a positive step when we are telling, you know, our fellow Americans and fellow Missourians that, uh, you know, we can help one another. We're not going to stand in your way uh, and, and stop you from giving away free, you know, uh, eyeglasses or free or free uh, 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 cancer screenings. You know, if, if there's someone willing to help you, there is no reason for the state to be standing in the way. And uh, it was great to be able to take this to, uh, we had a Cato conference in Philadelphia. Uh, the Show Me Institute was one of two uh, state-based think tanks. The other one was Goldwater. But I actually got to talk about some of the healthcare successes that we had uh, in our states. And, and this is what I talked about, the Volunteer Health Services Act. So. Very happy about that positive movement in that area. Uh, the other positive thing, and, and you know, it depends on who you talk to, they may not think this is positive, but this is positive, is that we didn't expand the Medicaid program. And, and to be real clear, Medicaid is a broken program. Um, when you look at the health outcomes of the Medicaid program, at best, uh, they don't improve them, and at worst, sometimes it actually makes people worse off than if they were uh, uninsured. Uh, and, and that is not the kind of program that I think we ought to be expanding. Uh, if you start burrowing down the research even further, uh, what you find is that contrary to what a lot of uh, politicians might tell you, is that Medicaid enrollment doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to have fewer people going to, say, an emergency room. In fact, there's a study out of Oregon that was published just uh, 10 days ago. I think it's 10 days ago, that suggests that uh, if you're in, uh, enrolled in the Medicaid program, you're 40% more likely uh, to go and, and use uh, emergency room services that you don't need. Um, so on the one hand, we, we want to make sure that people are being helped. But on the other hand, we also don't want to be putting people in a broken program that may actually, may not, may actually not only not be helping them their health, but also be extraordinarily costly uh, to the state, either directly or indirectly. Uh, a lot of times we're told the, the Medicaid expansion is free money, and that's not true for, for a variety of reasons. First of all, you know, if you assume that federal money is, is this free money, last I checked, I think we're all federal taxpayers. You know, we're, and, and in this case, when you're talking about Medicaid spending, you're really talking about debt spending. We're expanding the program. But it's not like uh, we were at, uh, uh, that we had a net, uh, let me re rephrase that. We started spending more on a Medicaid program during a time where we were already in deficits. 
And so every dollar that we're really spending on this expanded Medicaid program, arguably, is debt from the future. So we're spending money from the future for an entitlement today. I think that's bad policy. And if we're spending on a program that's not only really helping people on their health, but also uh, <laughs> is, is, is simply, in a lot of respects, just wasteful, uh, that's not a very good use of our money. So uh, from last year, those two uh, elements, I think, were positive. Uh, I don't think the Medicaid portion is really going to be a, uh, a big issue this year. I, it, my impression that the expansion is, is pretty much dead for 2014. They'll certainly be talked about, uh, but I, I don't know that it's going to really reach any critical mass where it's going to be talked about a great deal, and, and certainly I don't think that it's going to make its way through the Senate and probably not even through the House. Uh, I don't think there are necessarily majorities there either. Um, So, in the next year, when you look at the Affordable Care Act, one of the big things that's going to be coming down the pipe is uh, the uh, employer mandate itself. I think what you might end up seeing, it's been, it was supposed to be delayed for a year, and I think that it's arguable whether or not there was a legal foundation for the way that it was actually delayed. But uh, I, it, it's interesting that instead of having it come down in 2013 where employers uh, of a certain size or require providing a certain level of health care for uh, their employees or else face a, a fine or a tax, however you want to put it. Um, I think what that will probably end up resulting in uh, is a reduction in hours in some industries so that employers don't end up having uh, to pay the fines or provide that level of health care for a lot of these employees. That's really the biggest issue, I think, coming down uh, on the Affordable Care Act in 2014. Uh, you know, lots of things can change with the Affordable Care Act we've, as we've come to find out, regardless of whether uh, the law says you can change it or not. But I think that's probably the biggest issue, and I think that they'll probably end up affecting uh, hours uh, worked by a lot of employees, and I think that that works to their disadvantage. Instead of having one job <clears throat> where you can put in 40 hours a week but not necessarily have health care, you may have to get multiple jobs uh, because they may end up limiting your hours to 29 hours. Uh, because that's the way they avoid some of the fines that, that accrue through the Affordable Care Act. Um, and, that, and if anyone has any questions about the Affordable Care Act, I don't, I don't want to, it's a, a very large piece of legislation, so I don't want to leave one part out if someone's very interested in one part of it. But that's probably the biggest issue I think that's coming up. Um, and then one last thing I'll say is that uh, I'll talk real briefly about what I would see as an ideal Medicaid reform. And I, I don't think that we need to, to, uh, to necessarily spend more money on the Medicaid program. In fact, there's really no relationship between how much money you spend on Medicaid and whether the results of Medicaid are, are any better. You really need to go through and, and actually effectuate substantive reforms to how we view insurance, how we view the Medicaid program, to really get the cost down and really deliver better, better care and I need better services. And so when I look at the Medicaid program, you look at the studies, particularly out of Oregon, it suggests that if you want to, uh, if there is one thing that Medicaid could provide, it's essentially financial security. There is, there is a, 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 I guess, mental, psychological benefit to knowing that your, uh, your financial well-being isn't at risk. Uh, once you get Medicaid, that's what it suggests is, is happening. And you look at how much we spend on Medicaid and, and you look at what the private market could do instead, I mean, if I, you could probably make people feel a little bit uh, better off financially at a much lower cost. And so what I would suggest is instead of just expanding a, a broken Medicaid program, reform it in, in, a, in, in this kind of way. Take what we're already spending and split it into health savings accounts. Once you split into health savings accounts, require that the Medicaid participants purchase a catastrophic plan. Okay, whatever is left over they can actually apply towards specific services. Okay, this is kind of the market component. If, if right now a lot of Medicaid patients aren't really negotiating prices for their services, in fact, they kind of see it as a, a, a blank check. And a lot of people in the private market view healthcare as a, a blank check as well. It's why I, th I think you see a lot of costs for healthcare rising because uh, there aren't really any consequences for overspending. Okay, the market mechanisms really aren't in place. So if you incentivize, or you basically put the incentives in place, 
for Medicaid patients to save money, essentially. I think that that will actually put pressure on other uh, private health plans as well and get the cost down as well. It provides for a, a sort of market mechanism to keep prices low, whether it's primary physicians or whether it's uh, optometrists or, or, or some other uh, health care good. Um, I would probably let the money roll over year to year, but I would also say that one of the problems is getting folks out of the Medicaid program. And I think there has to be an incentive to get them out of the Medicaid program. So if you're going to split the current spending between all the different uh, beneficiaries, uh, I think that there may be some value in saying if you, get, if you earn enough money, if you end up disqualifying yourself from the Medicaid program, that whatever money that you saved or whatever money is left over, there's going to be a percentage we take out as kind of a to just for risk. But you can take that money and, and privatize it. One of the problems is that when you combine income and you combine state entitlements and benefits, there is this drop off at, at certain points. So you hit, you know, uh, twenty-five thousand dollars of, of income, and, and suddenly uh, you dis disqualify yourself from some state programs. It actually acts as a disincentive for people to make more money. Well, we want to remove that. We want to make sure that people have incentive to make more money. And, and make sure that, that that line smooths out from, you know, $25,000 to $25,001, that there isn't some giant entitlement drop-off. Um, I don't know if there's going to be legislation that is particularly on point uh, in the coming legislative session that would effectuate something like that, uh, but I think that that is uh, a reform that we may want to move toward. The HSA idea has been talked about for years and years and years, uh, but I think that uh, now is a good time to talk about it seriously. Um, I, I, one of the barriers, I think, is the fact that you have to basically re renegotiate this contract with the federal government. If you're going to make that big of a change, and you have to get waivers and um, and the like. Um, I think you can pass legislation like that at, at, with a trigger. And so, if you want to enact an, kind of an ideal Medicaid program. I think the time to do that is probably now rather than later, because as soon as the federal government steps in and says, okay, states, you can decide exactly how your Medicaid program is going to be structured, there is going to be a lot more political pressure uh, on what that final result is. I think if you pass it now and it's kind of an ideal, when the opportunity presents itself and the federal government says all the different states can choose their Medicaid programs, you won't have to relitigate that fight. You won't have to go through and, and, and uh, expend a whole lot of political capital because that fight will have already been fought maybe a few years before. Um, but I think that fundamentally, on the Medicaid front, expansion is bad news. Uh, to the state, over the next 10 years, if you expanded Medicaid, it would cost between two and a half and three billion dollars. Um, and there is, hasn't really been a, a robust discussion of how that would be paid. Uh, it's not free money, certainly, uh, and I think that on Medicaid, it's more important that we reform it rather than expand it. Uh, and, and, and the reason, and, and, and I, I want to be real clear on this, too, the reason that we want to fix Medicaid, is there's a, always the fiscal element of it. But, you know, like I said, free markets are about people. And, and if we want to make people better off, Medicaid is, is an important reform that we have got to pursue. Uh, folks are suffering. Folks are suffering within the Medicaid program. And, and I think that we can do a lot of good by enacting reforms that empower individuals to take greater control over their care rather than have this you know, top-down approach where the government decides what's good and, and not good uh, for these patients. So I uh, thank you for your time.